Okay, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I recognize a lot of you from the previous sessions, those of you who haven't met me before. Uh, my name is Jeff Thayer, and I've been covering the civil portion of our uh, monthly seminars. Um, and I'm going to be doing the same today, uh, this evening. Um, as far as the civil cases go, anyways, I'm going to be talking about the initial trial preparations and um, trial documents up through opening statements. Uh, and Dorian's going to be covering um, similar areas for criminal law. Uh, I'm also going to be covering some of the uh, Bats and Wheeler stuff that um, <clears throat> Natasha Chi prepared an outline for. Um, hopefully, if you pre registered, you got both my outline and Natasha's outline. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be here this evening, but um, um, she did prepare some stuff on Bats and Wheeler that I'm going to cover. Um, for Bats and Wheeler, the same principles uh, do apply to civil cases, even though. Um, a lot of the case law comes up in the criminal context, so if you do any research into it, you're going to find a lot of uh, people versus so-and-so cases. Um, but um, the, the outline I prepared on, on the civil portion uh, is roughly um, chronological in, in terms of how you can expect to do things um, in order in a civil trial. But, but I say roughly because a lot of what goes on initially is dependent on which court you're in and, and which judge you're with. Um, and so there, there can be a lot of occasions where the judge or the court has specific requirements about how they want to do things and which order they want to do them. Um, and so you're not necessarily going to be doing the same things in, in the same order every time. Um, but the first thing I, I talked about in my civil outline was, and this is kind of obvious, but just remember, if you want to have a jury, uh, make sure you've requested it, and um, you know that comes up the first time in, in the case management statement you submit in the judicial council form. Uh, there's a specific place to request a, a jury. If you're not using that form, um, you know you should still um, put your request in writing and reiterate the request orally at the case management conference. Uh, make sure the judge knows, even if it's not the judge you're going to end up in trial with. That, that you're requesting a jury. Um, and just be aware that there are going to be some fees associated with jury trials that you're not going to have uh, with judge um, presided trials. Uh, you're going to have to pay an advanced jury fee. Uh, it's a non -refund refundable $150 for each side. So, you know, if there's more than one plaintiff, that's um, at least one plaintiff has to pay that who's requesting a jury. And if there's more than one defendant, at least one of the defendants has to pay that if, uh, uh, if they're requesting a jury. Um, and then keep in mind there's going to be daily juror fees. Uh, they're fairly modest, but um, you know, if you're going through a voir dire process for a while, um, that can add up if you're going through a fairly significant panel. And um, you know, if your trial is going to be for several days or several weeks, it can, it can add up to be a, a significant chunk of change. So just to keep in mind that um, while having a jury can be beneficial to you, you do have to incur some additional um, costs associated with that. Um, one of the other things you want to consider uh, at the outset as you're getting ready for trial is whether you want to bifurcate trial. Um, and, and that means splitting the trial up into separate portions. Um, one example is it's common a lot of times, in, uh, for example, in uh, injury cases, or product liability cases to want to try the liability portion first. Um, and then, uh, if punitive damages becomes an issue, try that second. Um, because a lot of the uh, discovery and the evidence related to punitive damages isn't necessarily um, going to be really related to the first portion of the trial. Um, so, you know, and, and some courts actually do that as a matter of course, too. Um, so you want to consider whether, in your case, it makes sense to think about bifurcating the trial. Are there issues in your case um, that can be dealt with more quickly than the entire case, and if they're resolved in a certain way, uh, would make any second portion of the case non-necessary? So you can, um, you know, that's one way uh, 
um, you can think about trying to save costs. And you can pitch it to the court that way, too. You can say, Judge, you know, there are these issues we can try first, and if they're resolved this way, we don't need to try the rest of the issues. And judges, a lot of times, will be receptive to that because they want to, um, they're always conscious of judicial economy and things like that. Danny? Um, what are the calculations that go into whether you want a bench trial or a jury? You know, I do a lot of my work currently on the defense side, and um, it depends on which judge I'm going to get if I know that ahead of time. Um, some courts are going to be direct calendar, where you know very, very early on who your trial judge is going to be because it's going to be the same judge you're dealing with on discovery and summary judgment motions and other the pre-trial matters. Um, other courts, so LA is an example of that direct calendar. Other courts like San Francisco will have a presiding judge and then they'll send you out to a different judge for the trial um, and usually that doesn't happen until the, the actual trial date. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm in a direct calendar court um, and I know ahead of time who the trial judge is going to be, um, that would factor into my thinking about whether um, I want a bench trial or a jury trial. And in terms of the judge, what I'm thinking about a lot of times is how they treat evidence and how I know how they treat evidence from previous cases. Um, is this a judge who tends to let a lot of stuff in or do they tend not to let a lot of stuff in? Um, and because I do a lot of my work on the defense side, I, I just usually feel a lot more comfortable with a judge who I know is, is not necessarily going to let a lot of stuff in because I like to control what goes out to the jury. Um, plaintiffs, a lot of the plaintiffs I deal with, on the other hand, like to have a jury trial. And you know, so if they want a jury trial, um, they're going to get it. But I mean, that the other thing about a jury versus a bench trial is um, whether you think a jury in the, whatever jurisdiction you're, gonna, you're in is going to be, uh, how, how are they going to receive your story, whether you're on the plan for the defense side? Um, do you have an issue that that is especially complicated and that you think might actually be dealt with better in a bench trial than, than by a jury. Um, so just, there's a variety of things to think about. Um, it, a lot of it comes down to your own personal experience and whatever jurisdiction you're in and, and um, what's worked for you in the past. So. Um, but yeah, so think about those things. Think about whether you want to bifurcate trial if there's any issues you think would better be served, uh, try and first. Um, think about whether you want the opposing party to show up to the trial um, because you want them to testify as opposed to using their deposition testimony. Uh, if you want them to show up, you have to serve what's called a notice to attend. That's got to be served at least 10 days before the trial date. And then if you want them to bring documents with them, uh, to the first day of trial, you got to serve a uh, notice to produce, notice to attend, and produce documents, and that's got to be served a little um, extra in advance, 20 days before the trial date. Um, you know, on the defense side, I often serve that um, if I want the plaintiff to show up in person and produce documents. Now, this isn't a discovery device, so you're not supposed to serve it on them and have them produce documents that you didn't already ask for in discovery. Uh, but there may be some documents, for whatever reason, that you don't have handy, that they haven't produced yet, or um, that maybe were recently, um, that you know recently came into their possession that you want them to produce that, that do relate to earlier discovery. And that, in that case, that's something where you'd want to make sure that they appear personally and bring whatever documents those are uh, with them. Um, if you're thinking about calling third-party witnesses, record custodians, um, those aren't parties, so they're not just going to show up. You've got to serve a subpoena or a subpoena deuces tecum. Um, and there's no specific time limit on that, except it's got to be um, a reasonable amount of time to prepare and travel or prepare the documents and submit them in response to the SDT. Um, you know, make sure that <coughs> along with the subpoena, you're tendering the correct amount for witness fees and mileage. Um, and those amounts are set out in the Civil Procedure Code and the Government Code. They're fairly modest. Um, you know, they were established 20 or 30 years ago and haven't really changed since then. Uh, but you do want to make sure you get those fees paid. Um, otherwise, they 
might not necessarily show up or be com compelled to show up. Um, think about your exhibits. Uh, different courts will have different local roles and different judges will have different ways that they want to deal with exhibits and exhibit lists. Um, but typically, you're going to have some sort of requirement, whether it's from the judge or from a local rule, to submit an exhibit list ahead of time, if not um, on the day of trial, and to meet and confer with the other side about the exhibit list. Um, if you have a lot of exhibits that you potentially may use, hopefully you can reach some sort of stipulation with the other side and with the judge, um, whereby you don't have to produce all the exhibits at one time. In, in other words, um, uh, what I do a lot in a lot of my more complex cases is um, on the Friday or, or the Monday, uh, we'll talk with the other side and the judge about which specific exhibits from our exhibit list we want to use for the coming week and we'll have to produce copies of them. Um, well, we've already produced copies of them, but we'll have to produce the actual copies we're gonna use at least 48 hours in advance uh, for review in case there's been any change to them. Um, the, uh, the whole point is, though, to avoid surprise at trial, so you're not supposed to um, come up with anything extra that's not already on the exhibit list you've submitted to start of trial. Um, so think carefully about what documents you want to list on your exhibit list. I, always, I tend to be over-inclusive rather than under-inclusive. If there's something I'm not sure I'm going to use, but there, there's always a chance it might you know, be useful or an issue might come up that makes it useful. And I'll go ahead and include it on the list, even if I don't end up uh, actually using it. Um, and some, some judges will want hard copies of all the exhibits on day one. Some of them will be okay, and that's more and more the case now as we get more electronically savvy. Some of them will be okay, especially if you have a lot of exhibits with exchanging electronic copies and then producing the hard copies uh, later if you're actually going to use them. Um, you know, when you do have to end up using hard copies, just make sure you have plenty. I put in my outline, have at least five copies ready, um, you know, for various people. Um, that might be different in your case too, if there are different um, different personalities in your case. But just make sure you've got plenty of copies for everyone. Um, and there's a lot of technology, and there's a lot more being used nowadays to blow up exhibits for use at trial, whether it's um, on an Elmo or um, doing something with a PowerPoint or doing something with a PDF, where you can highlight specific portions of documents and make them larger for the jury to read. Um, all of that technology and how you want to use it with your exhibits is stuff that should be covered uh, with the other parties and with the judge, um, either at the CMCs or at a pre-trial conference if there's one, or on the first day of trial um, if there's no pre-trial conference. Um, the judges want to, going to want to know that anyways. They're going to want to know how you're going to proceed, and they're going to have their own preference as to how you should proceed with, uh, with your exhibits. So, you know, you'll have plenty of opportunity to discuss that with, with everyone else, but just make sure that whatever questions you have or answers, and you know going forward what you're doing and what the other party is supposed to be doing, and hopefully there won't be too many surprises. When you're dealing with technology, there's always um, technological issues that, that come up, even if um, you're used to whatever equipment you're dealing with, and those just usually have to be dealt with as they come. But um, if you do have some familiarity with the equipment, it, it helps uh, deal with this, those issues as they arise. Um, figure out if the judge or the court and their local rules require a trial brief. And a lot of times that'll be something that, uh, it'll be a document that lays out um, the issues typically in very general, broad terms, uh, what the key issues are, what you anticipate the key evidence is going to be, what you anticipate the key questions of law are going to be. Um, and the requirements of this are going to vary from judge to judge and from court to court. Um, some judges may be fine with not having a general trial brief like that, but they may ask for more specific trial briefs if certain issues of law come up that they aren't familiar with and want some more education on. Um, and that's something else you can talk to the judge and the opposing parties about at the uh, CMCs, the pretrial conferences. 
Um, and, and even if the judge says, or, or even if the judge does not say specifically that he wants one, uh, think about submitting one anyways. If you think that it would help to educate the judge about some general issues in the case or about specific issues um, that are unique to your case that you don't think the judge has probably uh, addressed before and you'd like to have them look at a little case law on it before you get too deep into things. Um, find out if you have to do a witness list and if you do uh, figure out what has to be on it. Um, I've done a lot of different witness lists and again this varies from court to court and judge to judge. Um, some of them have been as simple as here's a list of the names of the witnesses I anticipate calling. Others have been a lot more uh, complex where you not only list the names but you the judge wants a, a brief description of what you anticipate they're going to say um, and a time estimate as well so they can factor that into their their overall time estimates for how long the trial should take. Um, so again this is something um, that will be discussed with the judge and the other parties um, and you know you need to find out exactly what you have to submit, when you have to submit it um, and what information has got to be on it. Um, one of the more important things you're going to think about and work on as you're going into trial are motions in limine. And what these basically are, are motions to exclude specific pieces of evidence uh, that you anticipate the opposing party is going to try to introduce. And obviously these are going to be very specific to whatever case you're working on. Um, so as you proceed through the case handling and get closer to trial, you should be thinking as discovery issues come up, um, what, what are the key pieces of evidence that I don't want the opposing party to even get to the jury in opening statements? Um, there's case law that says the purpose of a motion in limine is to prevent having to unring the bell because opposing counsel mentioned something in openings that he didn't want to, them to, and even though you made the objection and the uh, judge admonished the jury, the jury obviously can't unhear what they just heard. So you want to think about what are the key issues of evidence you think the opposing party might bring in um, and that you think are improper to bring in and that you want to try to exclude right off the bat. Um, if you've got issues like that in your case, you need to address each of them with a motion and limine. Um, and they can be very brief, they can be very complex, it just depends on what the specific piece of evidence is and how uh, complex the case law is. Um, that supports your argument. Uh, a lot of times the local rules and or the judges are going to have uh, specific requirements for when you have to uh, exchange motions and eliminate with the other side, when you have to file them, uh, when they're argued. Um, sometimes they'll be argued at pre-trial conference before the trial. Um, other times you'll go to the judge on the trial date and he'll decide, he'll let you know when he's going to hear the motions and eliminate. Um, some judges uh, have specific types of motions in limine that they'll let you know they already have a tentative ruling on because they've heard about heard them a bunch of times before. It just depends on what the issue is in your specific case. If that's the case, they'll let you know about it. And if you think your issue is a little different, um, you can discuss that with them at that time. Um, keep in mind also that the motion in limine isn't just a means to try to exclude evidence, it's also a means to try to educate the judge about um, issues that are specific to your case and that they may not have dealt with a lot before. Um, so, you know, just keep that in the back of your mind, too. Um, keep in mind that your motion has to be based on some specific argument as to why the evidence you want excluded should be excluded. For example, it's speculative, um, and therefore it's lacking in foundation, or it's more prejudicial than probative. Um, or, or there's some specific case law on the specific issue that says it shouldn't come in. Um, you know, just keep in mind that, that you want to tell the judge, you know, this piece of evidence shouldn't come in. This is the specific statute or case law. Why? And, you know, try to make it as clear cut for them as possible. Um, now, going into uh, voir dire, um, a lot of times the judge will want the parties to meet and confer on a very brief, and by very brief I mean two or three sentences, statement of the case that they can read to the um, jury or the potential jury when they start 40 year. Um, this is supposed to be very, very general. It's supposed to 
in very general terms, describe the nature of the case and who the parties are. And again, it should just be a few sentences. Um, usually there aren't a lot of issues with that, although um, parties being adversarial, there, there can be issues about specific words and whether they, they should be used or not be used or other words used in their place. But, um, you know, that, that's something that um, can be usually be dealt with fairly quickly, but um, there could be issues that arise with that. Um, now, when it comes to voir dire, the judge is going to um, set out the procedure as far as how much time each side is going to get. Um, and uh, if, if you've got multiple um, parties on one side, multiple plaintiffs or multiple defendants, and multiple counsel representing those parties, uh, the judge may address issues as to which specific counsel um, should be doing voir dire. Um, th this is all stuff that's going to be discussed with the judge again at the pretrial conference or on the first day of trial. Um, the judge may start off with some general questions, um, you know, for the jury, but then they're going to give it, eventually give it over to the attorneys to ask questions, the plaintiff's counsel will go first. Now, in, in a lot of my civil cases, we've had the potential jurors fill out jury questionnaires before we actually start the voir dire. Um, and, you know, those can contain a lot, a variety of different questions. Uh, usually they've got some background questions to get some general information about the jurors. And then depending on the type of case, um, you may have more specific questions. Um, for example, if, you know, one of the parties in your case is a corporation, you may have questions about how the potential juror feels about corporations, if they've had negative experiences with them, um, things of that nature. Um, if your case involves a specific type of industry, there may be questions in the questionnaire uh, geared toward um, whatever experiences and feelings the potential juror has about that industry. Um, the questionnaires can be highly useful um, for helping you narrow the focus of your voir dire. Um, so instead of starting out with a lot of general questions, you can see which jurors you specifically want to talk to, which jurors may have a potential bias that you can ferret out, or which jurors may have a potential bias that the other side is going to try to ferret out. Um, and, and you may look at those questionnaires to see if you, you can figure out if there's a basis to um, uh, think about rehabilitating them once the other side's dealt with them. So, you, you know, I, I find, at least in the civil cases, that the questionnaires are very useful. Um, they're also very useful if you're enlisting the help of a jury consultant because the consultant can look at those ahead of time and give you pointers on what they think about the potential jurors based on the questionnaire and which ones you need to focus your questions on. And good ones will, will give you specific examples of questions um, that you need to ask. Um, And I've discussed in my outline uh, kind of the general types of questions that are permissible during voir dire and, and other types of questions that, um, that are frowned upon. Um, now keep in mind that you're going to get a certain number of, uh, and the other side's going to get a certain number of peremptory challenges uh, to the, the potential jurors. And the peremptory challenges are challenges that you can exercise as to a juror without having to explain why you're exercising it. The, the other challenge is a challenge for cause, where you have to say, judge, uh, based on what this potential juror said in the questionnaire or what he said on voir dire, uh, there's some bias here. It doesn't sound like the juror can be fair and impartial. Um, I think the juror should be excused. That's a cause challenge. And you get an un unlimited number of cause challenges, but you only get a limited number of peremptory challenges. And you don't have to say why you're using a peremptory challenge. Um, and what's discussed further in Natasha's outline is the case law on Bats and Wheeler. Um, and that's where someone's used a peremptory challenge, and you're challenging their peremptories, saying that they're not using them properly because they're using them uh, to try to exclude a certain person or certain people from what's called cognizable group. Um, which can be race, religion, gender. Um, and 
the, uh, the name Batson-Wheeler comes from the uh, two cases that are key. Batson is the U.S. Supreme Court case, and Wheeler uh, is the California case that followed shortly after that. Um, and you can look at Wheeler for, and some of the subsequent, subsequent cases for um, specific examples of how you go about establishing a prima facie argument that the other side is using their peremptories in an improper manner. Um, you may say, look, they're um, trying to exclude all the black people on the jury or a disproportionate amount of them. Um, they are not asking questions of these people similar to what they've asked of the other jurors, um, or they're not asking questions of them at all. Uh, they are, um, all of these jurors that they've excluded on peremptory, or tried to exclude on peremptories are, um, are pretty much uh, the same, or pretty much uh, different, except for this one uh, specific um, trait of theirs that's a cognizable group, such as race or religion. Um, you know, those are the kinds of arguments you're going to make if you're making a Batson-Wheeler motion to try to at least establish the first step, which is a prima facie case, that the other side's using their peremptories improperly. And, and assuming you've made that prima facie case, the, uh, the judge is going to give the other side an opportunity to explain why they made the peremptories. And what they have to do is come up with a reason that they made them that doesn't involve trying to exclude all the members of one cognizable group, because that would be improper. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that they could explain uh, why they did that. Um, they could point to some other um, answer that the potential jurors gave to the questionnaire or to the voir dire questions that, um, that they didn't feel comfortable with. Or um, they could, you know, I mean, there are a variety of different reasons um, that the other side or, or that you, if you're being challenged, could um, give for, for saying, this is another reason I got rid of these jurors. And then w once that's been argued, the judge is going to look at um, the arguments on both sides and decide, basically they're going to decide what makes more sense. I mean, is it, um, is the argument that these jurors were excluded because they are members of this one specific cognizable group, is that argument the more persuasive one? Or is the reason that the other side gave for uh, attempting to exclude those jurors um, a reasonable reason, and does it appear that that's actually why they exercise the challenge and, and not because the jurors were members of a cognizable group. Um, so that's the Batson-Wheeler process. And like I said before, a lot of the case laws come up in the criminal law context, but the same principles apply to civil cases, and they apply whether you're a plaintiff or a defendant in a civil case. So, you know, it, as the other party is exercising their peremptory challenges, uh, keep in mind, they don't have to explain why they're doing it. But if you notice that they tend to be trying to exclude the same type of uh, juror, uh, pay close attention to that because you may have uh, a challenge um, and you may want to file a Batson-Wheeler motion. Uh, you may even want to make the objection after they've already made the peremptory challenges and um, indicate to the judge orally that you're, you're challenging what they've done on Batson-Wheeler grounds, and then follow up with the written pleading if the, the judge wants that. But um, pay close attention to that, because especially if um, the party that you represent is potentially a member of cog cognizable class, and the jurors that the uh, other side is trying to exclude um, come from the same class. Um, you need to pay attention to that, even if you're in the civil context, as opposed to the criminal context. Um, and when Dorian discusses criminal law, he may have some more pointers on Batson Wheeler from the criminal perspective, but uh, that's what I wanted to say on the civil side. Um, uh, how am I doing on time? You're doing okay. Okay. Um, so, and then, you know, as far as the rest of word year goes on the civil side, um, and also the other thing I want to point out about challenges is there are actually differences. Um, in the cause, number of cause challenges you can use in criminal and civil cases. Uh, in civil case, or I'm sorry, not cause, the uh, peremptory challenges. So in civil, you get six per side, uh, unless there are multiple parties on one side, in which case you get eight per side. Um, and in criminal, you get um, either 20 or 10 per side, depending on, on the offense that's alleged. So 
Um, you know, it, so when you're going through voir dire in the civil cases, you're going to be asking your questions, the potential jurors. The other attorneys are going to be asking their questions. Um, you're going to, uh, if you're the defendant, you're going to get the first cause challenges, um, and then the plaintiff's going to get theirs, um, and then the parties are going to alternate peremptory challenges starting with the plaintiff, and uh, that's all set out in the Code of Civil Procedure that I've cited in my outline. Um, and then once all the challenges have been exhausted or skipped, and there's enough jurors on the panel, um, then you have your panel. Now, if you're picking alternates to, uh, that may either occur at the same time or separately. I've, I've seen it happen a little more often at the same time, um, where you you know you get as many as 18 potential jurors uh, that you're questioning at once, and then you whittle down to um, the 12. Uh, actual jurors plus um, two, three, or four alternates, depending on how complex and how long your case is anticipated to be. Um, and I have seen cases where uh, they don't actually tell the alternates who they are until the end of the case. More, more often, it, it happens that the alternates already know who they are, but I have seen cases uh, and participated in cases where there's concern about the length of trial and whether the alternates are actually going to pay attention. Um, and they've, they've actually not been told that they're the alternates, uh, and, and the seats are rigged in a way that they don't know uh, until the end of the case. Um, the drawback to that is that sometimes they're, uh, oftentimes they're dismayed when they get to the end of the case, especially if it's been several weeks long and a especially complicated case, and they find out uh, that they were in fact an alternate, and their opinion doesn't count. Um, but that's. That's something you can consider if you think it's worthwhile in a, uh, in a case that looks like it's going to uh, be long or unduly complicated. Um, the juror questionnaire, uh, if you do do one in a civil case, there's likely going to be meeting confer with the other parties about uh, what questions should be on the questionnaire. Usually for the background questions, that's not an issue. But if you have questions specific to um, types of uh, corporations or industries or types of plaintiffs um, such as will be presented in your case um, that's where there can be objections to some of the questions sometimes and so there's going to be meeting confirm um, some of the questions that will go in the questionnaire um, and then the last thing that happens uh, at least for for my my portion today is the opening statement um, in the plaintiffs going to go first and then the defendants. Uh, keep in mind that the plaintiff doesn't get a rebuttal. Um, some defendants will reserve their opening for later on after the plaintiff's done their case. Some will go ahead and do their opening right away. Uh, I tend to think in most cases it makes sense to, for the defendant to go ahead and do their opening uh, at the outset. Um, I like, from the defense side, being able to rebut the plaintiff's points right away and um, and I also like being able to um, use that opening to give the jury a roadmap as to what I'm going to be doing as far as how I'm objecting to some of the plaintiff's questions and how I'm cross-examining some of their witnesses. I think if you give the opening statement ahead of time um, it gives the jury a little bit more of a clue as to what you're doing whereas if you don't they're um, kind of like well he's objecting he's uh, asking some leading questions, but I don't really know what it means yet. Um, that's my opinion, but you know, it may vary from case to case too. You may have certain cases where it makes more sense to hold off on the opening from the defense side. Um, keep in mind the purpose of the opening is to outline the evidence and the facts that you expect to come forward from the witnesses and the documents that are going to be presented on your side. Um, it's not the time to argue the case, and if you get too far into what could be considered argument, uh, it's likely the other party is going to object and the judge is going to admonish you not to drift into argument, which is more properly left for closing arguments. Um, and al along those lines, um, it, it may be okay to uh, talk about specific statutes or specific case law in the opening if that's a key issue in the case and the judge um, 
is assured that you're not going to drift too far into argument by talking about those things. Um, so if you do plan to talk about a specific case or a specific statute in your opening, you probably want to um, talk to the judge about that first and just make sure they're on board with um, what specifically you're, you're going to be talking about. Um, depending on which judge you have and which court you're in, you may need to do proposed jury instructions and proposed verdict forms early on. Um, for the jury instructions, uh, those are going to be the Cat, Cat Casey or the Badge Eye set. And um, I prefer the Casey, but um, other people prefer the Badge Eye. I think they've been around a little longer. Um, they get updated every now and then. Um, uh, you know, some judges have preferences on which ones they like, some don't. Uh, usually the ones you have to worry about at the start are the first series of instructions that have to do um, with what the jury is told at the outset of the case. Um, a lot of the instructions will relate to specific uh, elements that you and the other side are trying to prove or affirmative defenses and those you may be able to um, get the judge and the other side to agree to, to put off discussion on until you get further down um, toward closing arguments when you're actually going to give those instructions to the jury. Uh, but, but discuss those with the judge and with the other side um, and discuss whether they want a jury form or a verdict form ahead of time or or again, if you can do that later on in the case. Um, the judge is going to talk to you and, and the other counsel about what their trial hours are, uh, what specific days of the week they want to do trial, what specific hours of the day they want to do trial with the jury, um, what specific hours and days they don't want the jury there, but they want you there to deal with um, issues that come up as the trial goes along. Um, they'll talk to you about what their preferred sidebar procedure is, um, some judges will just have you approach the, uh, the side of the bench. Some will have you actually go out into the hallway. Um, they'll have the reporter do different things. Um, different judges have different ideas about whether you should ask for permission to approach a witness, whether they'll give you permission ahead of time. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, intricacies of the courtroom they'll want to talk to you about ahead of time. Um, one of the other things you're going to be working on a lot as you prepare for trial are page line designations, um, especially if there are going to be witnesses uh, that you anticipate using or that the other side anticipates using where for whatever reason they're unable to appear live. Uh, and so you or the other side is going to try to use, um, if you have their videotape deposition, you're going to use that. Or if you don't, uh, try to use portions of their deposition transcript in lieu of the live testimony. Um, and if you have witnesses like that in your case, or if you have discovery responses um, where you're going to try to cite to specific portions of them, um, you're going to have to do page line designations. Uh, a lot of times deadlines for exchanging those and ruling on them are going to be set out in local rules or specific judges are going to have specific um, uh, dates when they want you to exchange them and, and argue them. Um, Keep in mind when you're working on page line designations and when you're working on objections that um, it's important to keep track of which form objections were made during the deposition because you want to reiterate those. But there are also certain trial objections and hearsay and relevance come up a lot um, that may not necessarily or probably would not have been made at the time of the deposition that need to be made in your page line designations if they're appropriate. Because um, now that you're getting ready to use uh, these depositions at trial, now is the appropriate time to raise those trial objections. Um, another, th uh, one last thing, uh, you know, courts used to provide court reporters for everything. Uh, a lot of them don't anymore because they're cutting back uh, due to budget concerns. Um, if you want a court reporter, just make sure that you're retaining a court reporter and that they're either showing up for every day or the specific days you want them. Um, and that's something else that's going to be discussed with the judge and the other, the other parties in the case, uh, as well as who's going to pick up the tab for them. So um, that's pretty much it on the civil side up through opening statements. Does anyone have any questions before I turn it over to Dorian for criminal? OK. Thanks. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. On the um, jury fees, mm -hmm. 
Do you know if the case, first the case management conference gets put over, um, do you still have to pay them by the date it was first set? Um, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know if I've had that come up before, but um, yeah, I mean, the statute just says honor before the initial case management conference. So if it's put over, I think there's an argument that you could wait until later. Um, you know, that's that's probably something that um, the judge is not going to give you a lot of grief about if you uh, at least discuss that with the other side, and, and you know, they'll, they'll probably want to do the same thing you're doing. So I would just you know, have a meeting confer with them about that. But, um, you know, it, that's probably something that that uh, it's not going to be fatal if, if you have some agreement to pay them later. The judge understands because the CMC got put in. Um, any other questions in this one? Um, oh, yeah. So if you say you're it, you're doing more dear and you realize that there's some kind of um, problem with the other side's peremptories mm -hmm. and you want to deal with that in your motion and the judge wants something written, you, you probably wouldn't have prepared ahead of time because you yeah. couldn't anticipate it. I mean, I would at least, and, and maybe Doreen can speak more to this too, because I think he's done a little more in bats and wheeler than I have. But I mean, just in general, when I see something um, like that happening in, in court, and the thing about trial is things happen very fast. I would at least raise the objection initially and you know, explain to the judge what, what's going on and what your thoughts are. And you know, at that time, they're probably going to let you know if they want something written, or you can volunteer to do something written, or they may just say, hey, well, okay, let me know what your arguments are. Or, or what your thinking is, and let me see if I can roll on this right now. Um, you know, it, you, and that goes not just for Bats and Wheeler, but for with anything that, that comes up as you're going through um, board year or openings or some of the other pretrial stuff. If you see something going on, you think it's worth an objection, make the objection, and you can always follow up with, um, with you know, a brief to the judge or something like that if they need more information, and, and you haven't had time to put it all together. Yeah, they're going to have to stop the trial. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, they, they may just have to, you, the other council may have to argue there, or try to come to some sort of decision. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else on the civil side? Yeah, yeah. Can you just talk briefly about what you're trying to do in voir dire in terms of issues, jury, or certain things that might come out uh, besides ferreting out bias? Yeah, well, I mean, you got to be careful with <laughs> when you say conditioning the jury because you, you're um, um, you're uh, you're not supposed to use language in your questions that that might um, be read as persuading them to look at you know rule a certain way or, or look at things a certain way. I, I mean, the the real the real thing you're trying to do is fair out bias. And that's going to be easier with some jurors than others. I mean, some of them will say it right on the questionnaire. Um, others won't necessarily do that, but, but you know, uh, they'll, they'll answer Good evening, questions. everyone. Uh, my name is Dorian Peters, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, the criminal portion of our uh, trial section. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, jury selection and some of the things that you're not going to find in the CEP. Um, and, and why is that? Um, there's a couple reasons. One, um, I'm going to assume everyone here you know, has gone to law school. You probably might have done something like mock trial. So I'm guessing at some point you've done an opening statement or a mock opening statement. You've probably done some direct. You've probably done some crosses. You might have even done a closing argument. Very few people, though, coming out of law school have done jury selection. I've had to do a real motion and lemonade process. I've had to sort of uh, do sort of the cow crims and, and that type of thing. So that's what I'm going to focus on. With that said, um, anyone feel free to ask questions about any of those things that you may wonder about direct examination or cross-examination or you know, the prosecution's case versus the defense case, things like that. Um, so uh, next time uh, in our next session, which will be roughly a month from now, we're going to talk about the things that happen after trial. So sentencing, um, probation, restitution appeals, and some of the counsel's duties after trial. So, um, so let's start. So 
let's say you have a case and it's set for trial and you're, you're sent. Uh, you, you go to the trial department. Um, here in uh, Contra Costa County, we use a master calendaring system. All right, so uh, you'll report to the master calendar and then they'll assign you to a judge uh, for trial. Uh, why does that matter? Well, if you don't want to be in front of a judge and you want to use a periphery challenge, um, that it's important to know that you're, you're starting off a master calendar. Um, in Martinez, our master calendars run out of Department 8. That's Judge Kennedy's department, which is on the top of the Bray Building. Um, and then Richmond and Pittsburgh have their respective uh, master calendar departments. Sometimes you have to ask around. Uh, usually in Richmond, uh, it's been Judge Landau um, or Judge Hiramoto. In Pittsburgh, it's Judge Haynes. So that's where, we, that's where you start off. Um, what do you bring when you go to trial? What's going to happen on day one? Well, usually uh, after you get assigned out to a department, um, usually the judge wants to have a conference with the attorneys. Usually that conference is informal. And you just kind of tell the judge what, what you have in store for them. Um, usually the judge will just come up and say, hey, what kind of case is this? How many witnesses you got? How long do you expect it to be? What are the main issues? Sometimes they'll even do sort of a last-ditch attempt to settle the case, right? They'll just say, hey, why is this case going to trial? What are the arguments? Um, sometimes they'll deal with things like that. Um, then, uh, after talking about the case informally, um, usually they want to get jury selection started pretty quickly. Um, if you're, say, you're sent to the apartment by 9 a.m., you'll probably be going with the jury by about 10 or 10.30. And usually uh, you get them up. And usually during breaks and things like that, you'll start dealing with things such as motion eliminates, uh, witness lists, um, and requested jury instructions. So um, when you come to trial, you probably want to bring those things. And let's talk a little bit about those things, at least in the criminal content. So uh, you probably want to bring motion eliminates. And what are those, and why do you want to bring them? Um, I'm sure everyone's heard of them, but they're basically motion that you want the court to just consider uh, before trial, outside the presence of the jury. Usually, um, you're going to use these to try to deal with evidentiary issues that you don't want the jury to hear about, or things that you want um, sort of sanitized. So it's very common, for instance, to uh, make an objection to evidence that you think will be inadmissible. So say you're in a domestic violence case, and you know the victim of domestic violence is not going to appear, well, then you may want to put in your motion a motion to eliminate to exclude uh, the statements that they made to the officer because that would violate the hearsay rule as well as uh, Crawford, um, you know, as a testimonial statement by an out-of-court witness, right? Because if you don't put that in the motion to eliminate and then trial starts and the DA asks them, so what did the victim tell you, right? Number one, you got to be sharp, you got to catch it, and you got to object on time. But number two, you wind up objecting to a question. The jury starts to believe that you're hiding things from them, and now they know the victim made statements to the officer, right? So you, those are the things you want to try to get off the table before it even starts, right? So, you, so the jury never even hears it. Um, other things that you're commonly going to put in a motion limine is if your client has any type of prior uh, convictions. Um, if they're not, um, if your client's not going to testify and they're not moral turpitude, you probably want to try to get those excluded, right? You, you don't want the DA trying to bring in prior incidents that aren't necessarily related. Um, you know, we, we could talk more about uh, sort of the details of that, but if your client's not taking the stand, um, there's a very good argument you have for being able to take some of the, those things off the table. If a client does take the stand, the DA is probably going to be able to use um, any crimes involving dishonesty um, and maybe even some other felony type convictions against them. Uh, at the very least, though, even if your client is going to take the stand, you can move to have them sanitized. So, you know, if your client has a particularly heinous uh, crime, um, I frequently see judges say, well, you know, we can just tell the jury it was a crime of moral turpitude, right? You know, if, you're caught kid, if your client has some, like, child abuse conviction, right? You can say, well, judge, look, we, I know it's going to come in somehow, but I just don't want the words child abuse used. How about crime of violence or, you know, crime of moral turpitude? And judges will, are frequent, will, will, will frequently um, do that for you. Um, any type of inflammatory evidence that may come in against your client, you may want to uh, try to exclude. Um, of course, when we say inflammatory, um, you know, there's always an argument over what that means. Um, obviously, the DA is going to want to bring in anything inflammatory. You're probably going to want to keep it out. Um, you know, the, the key issue is whether how relevant it is to the charges, right? So, if you know your client's charged with assault uh, with a deadly weapon, 
and causing great bodily injury, and there's a picture of him with a broken bone, you know, there's a good argument it'll come in. Um, but, you know, if your client's charged with, like, hit and run, and there's, like, pictures of, you know, someone maimed in a car or something, you have a pretty good exclusion, uh, argument for getting that kept out, right? Uh, because it just doesn't go to the elements of, of the crime. So those are things um, that you're very commonly going to see in motion limines. That's by no means exhaustive. Um, obviously, look at your case. Look at all the evidence you want to keep out. Think of all the evidence that you might want to get in, but that maybe you should run by the judge first, i.e., maybe the prosecution witnesses has prior convictions, right? You think about those things. And just put it in your motion limine so that way you give everyone a heads up. You don't want to ever be accused of being unfair, using unfair surprise and things like that. So, um, so those motion limines. What else do you want to bring with you? Um, you want to bring a witness list. That's super simple, at least here in country costing criminal cases. All you need to put is the witness's name and usually put uh, where they're from, uh, usually city and state. Um, I typically do not put my witness's address on the witness list. Uh, but if asked, I will provide it to the DA uh, as you're required to uh, by statute. But just keep in mind, everything you file on the court case becomes a public record, and so you don't necessarily want to put people's information out there. So very simple. They could say Dorian Peters um, from uh, Martinez, California, <coughs> Martel Venegas from, where do you live? Concord, California. Concord, California. There you go. And that's simple. And just list your, list your witnesses out. Um, <coughs> Then the third thing you want to bring to your criminal trials is a list of proposed jury instructions. Now, uh, with the jury instructions, uh, the way that I've seen it done most often is you just kind of list what you want. Um, there are two sets of jury instructions criminal in California. There are cow crims and there are cow jigs. Um, the short story is nearly everyone uses the cow crims, so unless told otherwise, you use the cow crims. The Calgics are old school and mostly used in Southern California. There are a couple judges here that do use the Calgics. Um, judge Colin used to use them, but he just retired. And Judge Mills used the Calgics, so if you're in front of them, use the Calgics. But pretty much everyone else uh, uses the Cal Um Does anyone know else know if any other judges use the Calgics? Dean Coker? Yeah, I, I can't remember, but I had someone. Was it Zuninka? Rex is very rare. It's rare all the time. It gets, yeah, so there's only one or two judges, all right? Only one or two judges, and frankly, none of the judges that use Calgics are even assigned to trials right now. So you can pretty safely get by with the Calcrums, but know that Judge Mills, and that's Judge Bruce Mills, uses the Calgics. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do trials on Walnut Creek, and at that time, we had Judge Colin, Judge Mills, and Judge Grossman. And at that time, most of the judges used the Calgics, so we would have to do both and you would never know until the time you got there. So those days are over, thank goodness. Um, just know that the instructions that you do before trial are preliminary. Um, some of what you are going to request is going to depend on the evidence. Um, some of them you're going to know ahead of time. So for instance, if your client starts with DUI, you're going to know that you're going to want the CalCrim instructions for uh, Vehicle Code Section 23152, which I believe is CalCrim 2110. And you know, and the one for the, the B section also. Um, ones that you're not going to necessarily know is um, you know whether anyone made a false statement or inconsistent statement and things like that. So you know, if you don't know if you want it, uh, I usually am over inclusive. And then before the jury instructions get submitted to the jury, the judge will always come back and go, "All right, now the evidence is in. Let's take a look at the jury instructions. Are there any that wind up that we ask for that we don't need?" Are there any we want to add in based on the evidence? But at least come with a preliminary list so the judge has something to start from. And then by the time you get to the end of the trial, you're just deleting stuff you don't want and adding stuff you do want. Um, do it with someone. If you've never done it before, do it with someone who's done it before because it's a little bit unintuitive. And people who have done them have a good idea of the instructions that are required versus the instructions that are optional. So once you do it once and you get a little template, it actually is not very hard. But to just do it the first time from scratch would be pretty challenging. So just you know, go to someone like myself, uh, or Dean Coke, or Angelo, um, and uh, you know, ask them. You know, come see your calcrums, or have you ever done calcrums for this type of case? I've done calcrums for probably a hundred cases that I just have sitting on a hard drive somewhere. So if you just need something to start with, uh, you know, let, let us know. Um, things to look out for when doing the jury instructions, though, just a couple things. 
uh, look out um, for the intent of the crimes charged. Um, it's very important whether it's a general intent or a specific intent crime. Um, obviously, uh, it helps us when the crime is specific intent. And so you just want to make sure you pick the right instruction. Um, look out for lesser included offenses. Um, so, you know, just the, it's all in the CalCrims, but just keep an eye out for it. Um, think about pinpoint instructions and look out for defenses. Pinpoint instructions are, are kind of interesting. Um, the jury instructions are all found in the CalCrims. They're nice and plain language. Anyone can understand them. Um, but sometimes you'll have a factual situation that is very similar to a published case. And if you have that, sometimes there's language out of that case that you want the jury to hear. And if the facts match, the judge actually can, and most of the time will, give a pinpoint instruction. So um, I'm trying to think of an example of uh, where I've seen this used. Um, for, uh, 422 criminal threats is a, is, a, is a statute where the case law has very significantly changed uh, the, the substance of the uh, jury instructions. So a lot of times in cases with 422s, you'll see people will request pinpoint instructions from a case to supplement the jury instructions. So that's, that's, a, that's kind of a, a decent example. Um, another thing you want to do before you get started, and you may even want to put this in your motion of lemonades, is you may want to propose having what are called 402 hearings. 402 hearings are hearings that you do before trial that relate to some to the admissibility of some type of evidence. Probably the most common 402 hearing that you'll ever encounter is a Miranda hearing, right? Everyone knows, everyone here knows that a, you know, a, a 1538 deals with Fourth Amendment, but that a Miranda hearing can't really be brought pre-trial. It can be, but it's not binding. Um, so you bring it at trial, that'll be done outside the presence of the jury if you request to have that done, and you almost always will if a statement is that issue. But you can also do a 402 hearing on the admissibility of other things that would require some type of elaborate foundation that you don't want the jury to hear for the first time. In a DUI case, um, you might, um, if there was a forced blood draw, you might uh, have a 402 hearing on whether that forced blood draw was legal. Um, sometimes those are done as part of Fourth Amendment motions also. Um, if they want to bring in the PAS results, but maybe you foresee uh, issues with the PAS or you see foundational issues, you can bring that up and say, look, judge, before they can mention the PAS, you know, particularly let's say the PAS is over 0.08 and the blood test is under a 0.08, right? You may want to say, judge, before they bring in these PAS results and, and say these numbers are from the jury, let's have a, a hearing to make sure that this uh, cop, who of course does not work at the crime lab, you know, did it right, right? So. Things like that you can bring up outside the presence of the jury. Um, I highly, highly recommend requesting them when there are evidentiary, evidentiary issues that you don't want the jury to hear about. And once they hear about it, it's too late, right? So just bring that stuff up if you, if you can and you can foresee it. Um, stuff to bring, bring a computer, all right? Um, bring an old school computer too. Bring one with like a CD drive because um, a, lot of the, a lot of times the DA will come and just drop a CD. Hey, we just got this 911 call. You don't want to hear it. Your office is 20 miles away, right? Bring a computer with you. Um, maybe bring a set of uh, aftermarket speakers that maybe plug into the USB slot or into the headphone jack. Um, bring cords. Uh, bring a projector if you're going to do a PowerPoint. Bring all, every adapter you can think of. Um, bring notepads. Bring a cell phone that has tethering. Um, the Wi-Fi at the courthouse is, it's okay, but it's hit or miss. So make sure you have a cell, a cell phone where you can put it, make it a hotspot. You can go online to do some last minute Westlaw research mid-trial if you need. Um, bring sticky notes and bring a folder. And, um, and I'll get into why you're gonna need that in just a moment. Bring your exhibits, pre-mark them. You can actually get those stickers that they mark the uh, exhibits with at like Staples. And so if you can, the clerk will love you. If the court staff loves you, you're golden. So just come in, pre-mark your stuff, bring five copies of everything. Five copies, all right? So during instructions, most unlimited days, uh, exhibits, bring five copies. Why? You're gonna want one for yourself, you're gonna want one for the defense, you're gonna want one for the court reporter, and yes, they will ask for one. You're gonna want one for the witness, and while the witness is looking at it, you're gonna want one for the judge, because they're gonna probably wanna look at it too. All right, 
You bring five. You never want to be one short. You bring five, they'll always be good. Sometimes you'll have one extra, and a lot of times that extra one will come in handy. So just bring, bring five of everything. I'm going to talk about jury selection, but actually I want to talk about one other thing, which is in criminal cases, people always want a jury trial for the most part. But is there any case where you ever want a bench trial? Anyone, can anyone think of a reason why you would give up the jury and want a bench trial? Go ahead, right there. Uh, maybe the client with the upside down cross and you know the, the bumpy tag, you know the, the bumps. Yeah, the in his head. yeah, yeah. The guy, the guy with the double horns tattooed on his face, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that, that's a very good reason. Um, the answer is, and people have different opinions. I'd be interested in hearing if anyone has a different opinion about this. Um, but in general, if you don't know, you want a jury trial, okay? All right, unless you have a very good reason you want a jury trial. Um, a bench trial is often better where you have an issue where you think either a jury would be very prejudiced against your client, so think tattoo of devil horns or swastika or something on his face, right? Um, or where your argument is uh, mostly a legal argument, not a factual argument. Um, or where the facts are such that you think a jury might be prejudiced against your client. So I have, for instance, a case right now where I have a client who's accused of punching um, a woman uh, twice. Um, he was charged with a 245, which I'm fighting now in Superior Court to get dismissed. I've at least contemplated doing a bench trial because I don't think it was a 245, I don't think the injuries were bad, and I think it was just a simple battery. But I kind of feel like if I were to take this to a jury, because this dude's punching a woman who was a stranger, I have a feeling that like, he might get convicted anyway, right? So it's just something to think about, right? Just, just have it in your head. Think about, you know, if, if it's a kind of case where your client might be prejudiced by a jury. Um, if it's not, you want a jury. But if you have some technical legal argument, you probably want a judge. Any other opinions on that? Angelo, Dean Coker? Yeah. Well, I've had uh, sometimes a child molest case. Like a slow play. Yeah, you, you have uh, circumstances which indicate that uh, um, the person really isn't very bad. You know, their husband was making meth in the house. They had nothing to do with it. The DA wanted eight years. And, and, you, and you get to a judge and get yeah, probation, you know? Right. So, um, so by, by putting it on in front of the judge, you need to have better results. Does, did everyone hear that? Does everyone? Okay. Does everyone know? Has anyone heard the term slow plea? Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, let's, 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 let's talk about a slow plea real quick. A slow plea is pretty much, um, a, as you know, if you plead guilty to an offense, that's pretty much game over. The DA is going to ask for an appellate waiver. You have to do the DA's offer. It's yay yeah, yeah or nay. You take it or leave it, and you lose all your rights to appeal, everything that ever happened. Okay. An alternative to that is getting what's called uh, a court offer. And sometimes the courts will give your client an offer where they can plead you know, to something the court offers. Oftentimes the DA wants this, they plead to the sheets. Not every judge follows that literally, but some do. Um, but there's actually another way of doing it where you can actually go to trial, preserve all your appellate rights, and basically just submit all the police reports and say, judge, we'll submit on the police reports. You know, everything in there is good evidence. And have the judge pretty much spend 30 minutes or an hour flipping through it, seeing if the elements have been met. And, you know, they sometimes will even indicate a proposed sentence beforehand. And they go through it, and they find your client guilty um, in an hour, maybe of a lesser charge, and then you get this good disposition or this good sentence that you otherwise may not have gotten had you done the DA offer. On top of that, even if the judge gives you a bad sentence, um, you maintain your appellate rights, and you can still appeal, and you can still do all the things that you would do if you had done it sort of the long way. Um, whereas if you took the DA plea, you got to waive your right to appeal and pretty much waive any irregularities, that type of thing. So uh, does everyone kind of understand that? All right, we'll move on. To give me a, uh, how's my time, Martin? You're doing good. Okay, but yeah. how much time do I have? Maybe 10 more minutes. All right, let's talk a little bit about jury selection. Um, jury selection in Contra Costa County. Um, we use a six pack method. Anyone know what the six pack method means? It's not, it's not abs. Here's a six pack method. Um, the six pack method means that when all the jurors come in, they're all gonna be sitting in the audience. All right, a typical, typical misdemeanor case, you're gonna have somewhere between like 40 and like 70 of them. 
what's going to happen is they're going to get random numbers, and then based on the random numbers, the jurors are going to be have their names called, and they're going to filter into the jury seats. There are going to be 12 of them. All right, so you got 12 jurors sitting there. Now, next to these 12 jurors, you're going to have an additional six seats. Those six seats are referred to as the six pack. All right, that's the six pack. So those jurors are basically next in line for the 12 chairs that will eventually be your jury. So what will happen is those, those, those 18 people will come. And then uh, when the voir dire process starts, uh, the judge will ask a bunch of questions of them. You'll write down their answers as best you can. Um, by the way, using those sticky notes I said to bring. And what, what I'll often do is I actually will put them in order so like it's a physical representation of the jury box, right? As a jury gets struck, I rip off the sticky note, put a new one on, write their name, take notes. It's hard, and you're going to mess it up the first three times you do it, but just do your best. Um, but yeah, you, you take down what they say, and then you're going to get a chance to ask those jurors questions. Now here's where it gets a little bit tricky, and this is what everyone always screws up, including me, and I've done this more than once, unfortunately. When you do the questioning of these jurors, you talk to all 18. So you're going to get 18 people that some of which you're going to like, some of which you're not going to like. But then... The, juror's gonna ask, the, the judge is going to ask you to start kicking jurors using peremptory challenges. You're going to have a chance to do calls. By the way, causes are worthless. They're worthless. The judges aren't going to kick anyone. Unless they get up there and say, I'm going to convict them no matter what. They're not going to kick anyone. They're worthless. So you're going to use your peremptories. And then, but, but when you use your peremptories, you can only use your peremptory on the 12. On the 12. You can't use them on the 18. Because what's going to happen is you kick one of the 12. And then whoever's next in line at the six pack goes to that person's chair. So say you got 12 jurors, you kick number six. Whoever was sitting at number 13 will go to six. And now there's five people in the six pack, and the 12 are full. Does everyone get that? No matter, it'll always happen. You're always going to see someone try to kick juror number 13 through 18 because you see their, see them on the sticky note and they still look horrible, and you have your eye on them. You know, but the answer is you can't kick them until they come into that 12. Does that make sense? Yeah. Has anyone ever done that? Anyone screwed that up? All right, just me, okay. No, no one wants to admit it, I understand, I get it. Leave me hanging like that. All right, um, where'd Jeff go? Oh, there he is. So um, Jeff talked a little bit about um, using jury selection to ferret out you know, people for cause. Um, I live life on the edge a little bit. I think jury selection is a persuasive process, all right? Um, now, you know, and, and people disagree about this, actually. You, like, when I, when I first started, I used it just for cause. And then after doing about 10 or 15 trials, I begin to, begin to think of it as a persuasive process. And it took some time for me to kind of get there, but that's what I believe now. Now, when I was in law school, I was voted most likely to be the next Johnny Cochran. But I was also voted to be the most likely to get disbarred. So you might want to follow Jeff's advice. <laughs> all right? I was voted both. All right? So, so, so what does that mean when I say that it's a persuasive process? Well, you know, you can't pre-try your case. You can't drop facts. You can't be telling them what the evidence is going to be. That stuff's off limits. Don't do it. The judge will snap at you in front of the jury. And all the jurors love the judge, regardless of how bad the judge is. So you don't want that happening. Um, but at the same time, I do think the process should be used to try to address hot button issues and to constantly remind the jury of the rights that your client has. So in a jury selection process, I'm gonna say probably 20 times, and I'm gonna be asking jurors about if my client's rights remain silent. Right? What you know, I'm gonna ask jurors, what if my client does not take the stand, if witnesses come up here and testify against him, and he he's sitting here, he can take the stand, but he does it. Can you be fair? Because you're gonna find a lot of people are gonna raise their hand and go, you know. If I was accused of something, I would take the stand and said I didn't do it, right? A lot of people feel that way, and it's a natural way to feel. We're human, right? But the rules of evidence and the law is not necessarily intuitive. So I challenge people on that. Push them a little bit, you know? Um, people have the, everyone knows that your client's there because you got arrested, right? And most people feel like if you got arrested, you did it, right? So challenge them. Look, my client has the right to the perception of innocence. When you think about that, it sounds fair. Most people will go, okay. But then when you push them a little bit and go, hey, when you're driving on the street and you see someone get put in handcuffs, what do you think about that person? What do you think's going on? And they're like, they did something, right? They did something. 
Right, so people, you know, you, it, it, it's, it's, it's easy from a detached intellectual standpoint to say I believe in this, but at the same time, our natural thought process is to assume based on limited facts, right? So challenge them, challenge them. And I sometimes will tell them, you know, a lot of times your clients are never to be shackled in front of the jury, they're not supposed to be in their jail clothes, but I'll tell a jury, yeah, he got arrested. You know, can you, can you look past that and look at the evidence? Um, challenge them on the burden of proof. The fact that if, if you wanted to, you could sit there with your legs up and not do a damn thing. And if the DA doesn't meet their burden, they're supposed to, they're supposed to walk your guy. Ask them if they can do it. Like, look them in their eye and ask them. You know? So, 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 so press the jury on those things. Um, desensitize the jury. So let's say you have a battery case. Your guy beat up someone he wasn't supposed to beat up. Well, you know, you can't pre-try the case with your facts, but you can use facts that are go beyond your facts. So sometimes if I have a battery case, I'll say, you know, if you heard evidence that my guy beat someone up with a baseball bat, stomped them, and did a bunch of stuff, you know, could you be fair, <laughs> right, you know? And they'll be like, yeah. And now they're expecting to hear about this guy getting clobbered by 10 people with a baseball bat, and then they hear, oh, it's just a punch, right? And they think like a little bit less bad about your client, right? <laughs> so, so, so think about trying to desensitize the jury because, you know, someone coming off the street, punches down really bad. But then when you start talking about stabbing and killing people, all of a sudden your punches don't seem quite so bad, right? Um, think about the type of jurors you want. Um, people say that managers and engineers are better for the DA, artists and healers are better for the defense. By and large, I mostly agree with that. It's beyond my expertise, frankly. You're gonna have to read books on psychology. Um, just be aware of the reverse case, though, which is like the sex case or the child abuse case um, or the DV case where some people would say that that kind of switches, all right? Um, you mean when they can blame the victim? That's the switch? Well, the switch is this. Um, typically speaking, uh, the DA, you know, the DA's gonna want, they want engineers because they're linear thinkers, right? So that they have like a good set of facts that are overwhelming. They're, and a linear thinker will be able to just convict, right? But from a logical standpoint, it makes sense. They also want managers, people who can hire and fire. Those are people who have had to go into an uncomfortable situation and say, hey, sorry, you're fired, Donald Trump, you know, <laughs> right? But, but the people who tend to empathize with our clients tend to be, for whatever reason, artists and healers. And when I say healers, I mean doctors, teachers, nurses, um, nurses. exactly. My mother is a teacher. And she asked me, would you put, keep me on a jury? I'm like, hell no, I wouldn't keep you on a jury, even though you're my mother. My mom works in West County, West Contra Costa County School District. She's a teacher in Richmond, and she believes in the best in people. And it's so, her job is so hard, but she has faith in these kids. No matter what they do, no matter how bad it is, no matter how rude they are, no matter how crazy they act, she has to come in there with an open heart and help these kids. So, you know, when I'm asking her to see the worst in someone because they beat someone up, you know, do I want her on... My jury when I was a DA, no. Now I'm a defense, yeah, yes, yeah. right? So, just, so, that's, so that's the thought process. Now, what's interesting is that in a child abuse case, though, the healer tends to fill empathy with like the child, right? Mm -hmm. Who's sort of a victim who like can't defend himself, right? Um, say, I think the same thing is true in sort of sex cases and things like that. That's at least the theory. Obviously, everyone has their own opinions about this stuff, and there is no right answer. This is just kind of opinion, sort of popular opinion. And you're gonna have to fill out for and yourself. Do you think or think that uh, empathizes with the with the abuser? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And actually, some people would say that you know an engineer would still be good for that case. Um, but the point is, people at least think that the floor shifts on those cases. Um, you know, at the DA's office, I would have um, DAs would joke, and these would be like left-leaning Democratic DAs would go, "I don't want any Obama sticker having a Prius driving people on my jury." <laughs> But then you get a child abuse case, and they wanted those people. So, I mean, there's some thought to this idea that, that you know, that the li you're more liberal, you're more artsy, you drive a Prius, you're more likely to empathize with the defendant. Why? I don't know. I don't know if it's true. I'm just letting you all know the popular theory. We could debate it for hours. Um, and there's lots of literature on this stuff. Um, and I'm not an expert. Either. So, um, how much time? Two minutes? Sure. Opening statements, um, just the facts, can't argue the law, you know. Um, think about a visual presentation, 
because because people remember it. Um, they say openings the new closing, um, and they also <laughs> say that the jury um, makes a decision very early in the process. So um, you have a choice as a defense attorney whether to do your opening statement right away or later. Um, I would typically pick right away unless you have a very good reason. Um, a very good reason would be um, you have no idea which way the DA is going, you think they're okay, they may not have a case, things like that, you might want to defer. But if you have a pretty I good idea of a case, it's a pretty straightforward case, go first and, and, and get your, your version of the events out there. Otherwise, by the time you talk, yeah, it's already over. Um, in the, during the prosecution case, try not to object to things unless it hurts you. Keep in mind, if they do something that's hearsay and it doesn't hurt you, it would be harmless error anyway, even if you objected and it became an issue on appeal. Uh, but you don't want the jury to think you're high and stuff. Um, handle as, as much of those things as you can in motion of lemon days. If, if they do something that's bad and it hurts you, object. If you don't, it'll be forfeited on appeal and you don't want to be an effective assistant of counsel or you know that person in the opinion, yeah, counsel should have objected and had no rational basis for not overturn. You know, you don't want to be that person. So just think about it, you know, um, and make sure you get an objection in there. Um, after the prosecution rests, consider an 1118 motion. That pretty much means that the prosecution proved their case, uh, didn't left out an element. If there's an element you saw that wasn't met, make the motion. Uh, we can talk more about that some other time. Um, order of witnesses, they say save the best for first and last, and pack all the boring people in the middle. So <laughs> experts, stuff where people want to fall asleep, put in the middle, but people remember the first thing and the last thing. And lastly, uh, rebuttal argument, I mean rebuttal case, pretty much um, just as the DA can respond to stuff you put on, it's pretty much that simple. Um, I'm not going to talk about closing statements, and the rest of it we'll talk about next time.